All right, I think we are connecting. So it looks like uh, Facebook is online. Sending data to YouTube. So those of you that jump in, uh, I haven't brought Instagram on with us yet because I want to make sure that we have audio this evening. So those of you that are jumping in, if you could let me know that there is audio that you can hear, um, I don't know 100% if they fixed the API mixer issue from last week. So like I said, if you could, if you're jumping in on either uh, Facebook or YouTube, just let me know if you can hear me. If not, we're going to make a uh, quick switch. So can you guys hear me on Facebook? Anybody? Nobody's typing anything. So, all right, Bubba Ford, I can hear you. Perfect. All right. So I guess they did fix. So uh, still don't see anybody from YouTube yet, of course. So, so let me go ahead and bring Instagram on with us. All right. We are now live on Instagram. So, hey. YouTube, good evening. Jerry Mees, how's it going, champ? I'm doing good. How are you? Western Contours, Merit9763 from Instagram. Welcome, guys. Uh, Clint White, L. Clark. Okay, we're getting a lot of folks jumping in. So, Jay Tappadin, how you doing? Bill Berry, loud and clear. So, I guess they did get the API mixer fixed. So, good. So, guy... Looks like we have uh, some content we'll be able to grab audio from for Friday's ECA feature podcast. So, in fact, for those of you that don't know about that, um, every Friday, guy over at Western Contours basically grabs the audio from Wapiti Wednesday's Q and Q and A, and there is a feature Friday uh, podcast uh, for Elk Calling Academy that is the audio portion so for those of you that travel or spend a lot of time in the truck or vehicle you like those podcasts definitely check out guy over at western contours um, not just on friday he actually puts out a lot of great material and in fact earlier this week he just dropped a interview that he did um, with mark mason the owner of hot hot on the trail sense you guys have heard me talk about the hot sense so if you want to know more definitely go over and listen to that podcast. Uh, Mark explains the difference between synthetics and reels and why the ruling change and had to go through or go to uh, synthetic. So go listen to it. Uh, Amos Adventure, nice bull in the back. Appreciate it. That is actually last year's bull. That is uh, Pitchfork. So, all right, Matt Flowers, good evening. Sound is awesome tonight. Nice job, Michael. Patrick, I didn't do anything. It was the API mixer that was going out. That's why there was all the volume issues, but sounds like they got it all taken care of. So, all right, since Scott Schmidt is here and he says we can start, then by golly, let's start. So, hey, everybody, my name is Michael Batiste from the Elk Calling Academy, and this is Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. If this is your first time joining us tonight, welcome. We're glad you're here. Also, if this is your first time, the way Wapiti Wednesday Q&A works is we typically tar start with a subject. Uh, tonight's subject is midday hunting tactics for uh, bow hunting elk on public land. Now, any time during, it doesn't matter if you're joining us from Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, feel free to input your questions and we will try to answer those on the fly as we're going. Now, also, if this is your first time here or if you're just enjoying the content, make sure that you like, subscribe, or follow, depending on which platform you're on, and also turn on those notifications. So, all right. So, midday tactics, and actually the question came in from Instagram, and it basically says, when elk are heading to their bedding area early in the day during a full moon, what is the best midday hunting tactic? Park yourself on a water hole, wallow, etc. So first off, let's kind of get kind of a misconception out of the way. A lot of people think that during full rut activity and not just full or, or during full moon and it's not just full moon, it's bright moon. It's it's, you know, the moon getting bigger leading up to that full moon and then also as it's shrinking. But it's those bright moon nights. 
So many people think that the elk are only active that first hour of the day and the last hour of the day and the rest of the time during the daylight is a waste. This is false. So basically, yes, elk will go to bed earlier that next morning after a bright new bright moon night because they've been really, really active during the night. So they've done a lot more feeding because typically on a dark night, they'll feed for a little bit, then they'll lay down, feed for a little bit, lay down. But on those brighter moon nights, they can see a lot better. So they're a lot more active. They're on their feet a lot more. And as the rut progresses, they're actually a lot of rutting activity because the temps are cooler and all that. Now, certainly, yes, they will go to bed earlier. But the thing is, is once they empty the contents of their stomach, you know, they'll lay down, they'll nap, they'll work on the contents of their stomach. Once that content is empty, once that stomach is empty, they are going to get up. And also the fact that they had, it, it's not like they go and bed down. They're not a teenager. They're not going to bed down and sleep for 14 hours. It's not going to happen. They're more like a three-year-old that can hardly sit still for 20 minutes. So, so they will go bed down. They'll sleep for a little bit. They'll empty those contents of the stomach. Then they're going to get up and they're going to get some water. They're going to feed a little bit. And a bull is going to check his cows to see if any cows are coming into estrus. So again, there's that misconception too, that the only tactic during a midday is, ooh, I need to go sit on a water hole or I need to go sit on a water source. This is far from the truth because you can actually get some really, really good running activity during that midday time. So it's still a really good time to call. I mean, that's what we're out there for. We're out there, you know, we're wanting to call, we're wanting to get these interactions. So why not do that? Why not call during the middle of the day? Now, I'm not saying that all of a sudden you just jump into a full-blown symphony of cow calls and bugles and this and that. You have to match your surroundings. In fact, I don't think I have ever said that phrase on any Wapiti Wednesday q and I've never said anything about matching your surroundings. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna start with a few soft cow calls. That's it. Nothing real loud, nothing real fancy, just boring old cow mews, nice and soft. You're gonna wait about four or five minutes and then you're gonna do this again. Now, a couple of things are gonna happen. One, you're either gonna get some sneakers that are gonna come in silently to you know, check you out. Or the other thing that's gonna happen is that bull that's been bedded down is gonna get up and he's gonna crack off a little bugle. What he's doing with that bugle, he's acknowledging that he heard you and he's also letting you know where he's at. Now that's the time you can move in, get thermals right, get set up and start working that bull. So Winslow or Caleb, to answer your question, the best midday hunting tactic is still calling. Just start small. And when you're doing this, especially with the cow sounds and you're getting going, like I said, you could have sneakers come in that don't say a word, that just come in investigating. You need to have an arrow knocked, you need to be ready, and you need to be scanning all around you because you don't know which way they're going to come in. Uh, initial ascent. So the full moon this year is on the 14th. How many days after this full do elk go back to being more active during the day versus night? Well, it's, it, it's not necessarily just how many days after the moon, it's how dark is the night. So again, people just focus on the full moon. Oh my God, it's a full moon. Our hunt is over. We're not going to be able to kill any elk this day. But guess what? What if that full moon rises at three o'clock in the afternoon and sets at one o'clock in the morning? You still have a pretty dang dark night. So there's more than just look on the calendar and oh, it's a full moon. You also need to look and see how much of the nighttime is that full moon going to be up? How much of that night is going to be bright versus dark? So, and yeah, it, it could most certainly be that that full moon comes up early in the afternoon, but sets at 11, 11.30 at night. So yeah, that evening you may not see any elk move during the daylight 
But as soon as it gets dark and that bright moon is there and they can see a lot better, man, then they move after the dark. I hear it all the time. It's a full moon. Elk just don't move. It's not even worth leaving camp. Perfect. If you want to have that mentality, stay in camp. But we're going to be out there during the day. We're going to be out there as much as possible. And we're going to be out there on the midday killing bulls because we've done it time and time and time again. That midday time is a great time. So now there's other factors that go into this too. It's not just so much what time the moon rises and the moon sets, but what kind of weather do you have coming in? Do you have a cloud cover coming in? Because again, if it's a full moon night or a bright moon night and a cloud cover comes in, that bright moon is now all of a sudden a wash. It, it doesn't matter. It's not a factor. It's not going to be up that long to make a difference. So, okay. Um, Hunting for Christ, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Jerry Keys, uh, Nicholas Curry missed last week, no sound. Yeah, a lot of people missed. I was not able to broadcast on Facebook or YouTube last week because of the API mixer. I was only able to go Instagram. So, so there is a couple of things that I talked about last night or last week that I will cover again tonight. So uh, that sure helps. Haven't thought about that. Thank you. You are very welcome. So uh, good to see and hear you, Chris. Good to see you too. Weed whacking, cow calling and listening. I love it. Uh, let's start out with a midday bugle. What's your thought? Um, typically no, because Arlen, the, the, the thing about ripping a midday bugle is you know, a lot of times you can get too aggressive with that bugle. And a lot of times, like when you're doing that, that cow sound, you're basically just going to get a lazy bedding bugle. That's basically all you're going to get. It's a bull laying in his bed, just eh, whatever. Eh. Yeah, I'm here. Whatever. If you want to come over. So, um, Anniversary from I'm out tonight. Later, by the way, my verdicts is awesome. Danny, I told you. So on highly hunted areas, how do you go about with your calling? I don't change. So um, reason being is the reason I don't change is because if you actually understand the full vocalization of elk and you are actually doing speaking just like elk or vocalizing like elk they're going to think you're an elk you're going to fit in with what an elk is doing also if you're paying attention to everything around you and your surroundings and basically if you're being natural with your calling and the amount of calling that you're doing and all this stuff it's it's natural it fits in and honestly too um yeah, there's, there's times we had it happen last year. We were set up, we were working a bull, and we actually had somebody, you know, kind of beaten up from behind us. And so, you know, we kind of sat down and waited to catch up to them, and, you know, until they caught up. And, and then it was like, look, hey, you know, we're here first. Respect that. Because obviously, if somebody was in front of us, we were going to respect that too. But also, we've done enough studying of the area between studying maps and also spending time up there that we have found little pockets that most people just drive right by and ignore. So a lot of times on weekends, which are heavily hunted, we'll go into those pockets. We'll go into those hidden areas where most people aren't going to go. And then we'll hit the popular areas on the weekdays when there's not as many people. So, um, so, in a nutshell, highly hunted areas, how do you go about your calling? Be different. Don't be doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. So uh, it's much easier to kill an elk midday than early morning, in my opinion. Super hard to kill an elk when they are transitioning between thermals in the morning and evenings. Tim Gonzalez hit the nail on the head. The reason sometimes it's hard in the mornings to hunt elk is because elk have a location they want to get to. They are heading to their bedding area, and nine times out of ten, most people are behind the elk and trying to turn the elk and get them to come back. It's not going to happen. 
um, that's why you kind of have to do your homework and know your area. So I'm hoping for cloudy nights. Oh, Josh, I, I always do too. Every time I see that moon getting big, I'm, I'm, I'm not really doing a rain dance, but a cloud dance. So uh, John Jones, first time live. I'm excited. I've listened to all, all podcasts several times over. John, welcome. We're glad to have you. So uh, Josh Nordwell, bugle, wait, move forward. So uh, not sure what you're meaning there. Um, Hunting for Christ. I have hunted whitetails for several years, but want to kill an elk one day. Any suggestions or tips for someone who has never hunted elk before? Keep it simple. So if you just want to harvest an elk, that cow routine that I talked about, that midday, you can do that. You can get into an area that basically you find fresh sign, you can smell elk, sit down, do those three or four cow sounds, wait four or five minutes, do it again. Stay, stay in that area for an hour. And if nothing comes in, then you keep following that sign until you get to another area, set up and do it again. But the key thing with that is be in an area that you have fresh sign. If you can smell elk, you're in a good place. Set up and start doing that. So, okay. Um, next question from, and it kind of ties into this first time elk hunter. I'm hunting elk solo this year for the first time, second time hunting elk due to my hunting partner injuring himself. Do you think it would be a wise decision to focus more on cows so that the size is more manageable if I actually get an animal on the ground? No, not necessarily. Because if you get a cow, that lead cow is going to be larger than a raghorn bull those lead cows can get huge. And in fact, uh, last Saturday we ran up to swap the cards on trail cameras and we also wanted to check out an area that we saw when we were scouting two weeks previous. And 200 yards, 150, 200 yards from the truck, all of a sudden we saw a group of 12 to 15 cows and calves moving through and good Lord, some of those cows were huge i was looking at their body size and i'm like man they're bigger than a spike they're bigger than some raghorns i've seen so honestly a better approach for this and this kind of goes with the first time you know someone who has never hunted elk before don't focus on antlers don't focus on trophies just focus on getting an elk on the ground because uh, an elk with a bow i mean it's hard enough it's a trophy, but you want to experience that. Now, you know, younger cow, spike, if you're solo back in a ways. But honestly, I'm going to adjust my thinking more on the solo tactic where I'm going to, that's going to dictate how far in I'm going to go. Now, that's going to be different for each person because everybody is at a different fitness level. Everybody has a different pain tolerance level. And... The reason I say pain tolerance is if you have never really packed a bull off the mountain or an elk off the mountain, you will understand what I mean by the pain tolerance the first time you do it, especially if it's in a nasty spot. So it's heavy, it's hard work, and you will experience pain. You will be in the middle of that pack out and you will be like, oh my God, I'm going to die. This is the worst thing I have ever been through. But I can guarantee as soon as that last load is to camp or to the truck, you're going to take that last heavy pack off and you're going to sit there and you're just going to take this deep breath. <sighs> you know, that really wasn't as bad, that bad. It wasn't that bad. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go again. So, so instead of more focusing on a cow or a smaller elk, adjust how far you're going from camp or adjust how far you're going from your truck. Know your limits. And a lot of times when I talk to people at seminars and say, know your limits, they have, oh, I have no problem hiking in seven miles. I'm sure you don't. But what about coming out heavy for seven miles and then going back in seven miles and then coming back out heavy again for seven miles and having to do that three or four times? That's your limits. The other factor that you need to take in is 
what's the weather how hot is it going to be how long is that you know meat going to be good for how much time do i have to get this elk off the mountain and i've seen people do this too go into nasty holes get a bull on the ground and all of a sudden they're up on top of the ridge calling their buddy in the middle of september hey i got a bull down can you come help me pack what do you mean you're 200 miles away in your elk camp you you need to be sitting at home on the couch waiting for me to call you to come up and help me pack out my bull not a good plan now, sometimes it works out where you can make a phone call and, yeah, your buddy's available and he comes up and helps out or a group of buddies. But that's not a good plan to rely on. So, okay. Uh, Dallin Madsen, hello. First time tuning in. Love the content on your Instagram. This conversation is going to be super helpful on my public land OTC elk hunt this year. Well, welcome. We are glad to have you. So. Western Contours, with that being said, what do you do for the limited time spent due to out of state and not knowing the area and habits, et cetera? That's the tough part there. That's where you'll be amazed, actually, if you really do your due diligence between maps and phone calls and, and I mean, really studying, um, you can gain quite a bit of information. Um, now, yes, I understand sometimes it is really hard you know to to definitely get out there for scouting trips we we definitely have an advantage for those of us that live in you know elk area and the scouting that we get to do all throughout the summer it's one of those things where if you really have that limited amount of time and it is a really new area if there's a group of you you might really want to consider contacting an outfitter and doing a drop camp to where they get you in um you can also kind of get you know some information from them um but that might be a really good alternative to help you know with that now it also depends you know is this a one-year plan is this a five-year plan how often do you plan on going back to that area because the more times you go back to that area the more you learn about it and the more proficient you're going to be in that area and it may be that that first year or two, it might be, you know, hey, we're going out to enjoy God's creation and really doing some info gathering and learning while we're hunting. If we get an elk on the ground, it's a bonus. But that information that you're gathering on the trip is vital because that's just going to help you in the future. And, and so that's, that's why the advantage of hunting an area year after year after year, you learn those pockets where they go when they're pressured. You learn those pockets where they go when, it's, when, you know, when there's weather. You, you learn all this information. You learn their travel corridors. You learn their bedding areas. You learn, you learn their feeding areas. All that information is just going to make you that much more proficient year after year with hunting that area. So, so Guy, hopefully that helps. So uh pack out a pair <laughs> dead after last pack out oh i've been there so uh hunting for christ i live in south carolina where would be a good place to go for my first elk hunt without breaking the bank you know honestly um what i'm going to do is i'm going to refer you back to a Wapiti wednesday q a we did a couple of weeks ago uh, if you just go to my youtube channel um go into the playlist, go into Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. Uh, there was a discussion that we did on selecting an elk area and how to get started and how to narrow that down. So I'm going to refer you to that Q&A. So uh, Joshua, I've been watching your videos on YouTube and I've learned so much. I didn't even know how to put a call in my mouth. So to now actually make an elk sounds, you're awesome. Thank you. That is why I do it. Feedback like that and hearing the stories of First Harvest is just awesome. It takes me back to when I started calling and when I started hunting elk. So thank you so much. So uh, let's see. My plan is the first elk within range is my target. Sean, that's a great plan. Josh Nordwell, buy the wife a pack. A phone call makes a huge difference. LOL bring marriage counseling to a new level pack elk with life you, you know there are a few things that will really test in a, a relationship packing elk together building a home together are just a couple of them so 
Uh, let's say, let's say you hear a bugle quarter mile away and you start heading that way and halfway there, the wind switches. Do you keep at that bull still? Matthew, yes. Because the reason being is before I even started to go to that bugle, I already calculated how long is it going to take me to get over there? What time is it going to be when I get over there? And what are the thermals going to do by the time I get over there? And, and also, as I'm gain, get heading over there, I'm gaining elevation so that I am on that same plane with him for the last little bit. So quarter mile away, you're not really that far away. So you're going to gain a good majority of your elevation when you first start. Because you want to be the last 500 yards, you're going to want to be on that same level. So, you know, you figure if you're a quarter mile away, you're going to start gaining elevation first, and then you're going to start working his direction. Because that way, if you're on his same level, it doesn't matter what the thermals are doing. It doesn't matter if they're blowing down or if they're blowing up. You're going to be covered. He's not going to smell you. So... Uh, D Rock D Pew, how you doing, bud? Eric Nelson. The last four years, I don't even get mad about the pressure, the people that I can't control. It's an excuse why you didn't tag out, is what I tell myself. Exactly. There's things that you can control and things that you can't. You can't control the amount of people on public land. And, and Eric's exactly right. We're the same way. We don't get mad about it. We just start thinking. That's why we always have a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, multiple plans because things happen. If you're keyholed into one spot, you're going to be that guy that's going to get mad and livid about all the pressure in there and all the people and this and that. Have backup plans and you can always adjust. That's why, that's also why we always, if, if we drive to a trailhead, that's why we leave early because if we get to the trailhead and somebody else is there and we have to drive to another trailhead or a closed gate or something, we want to have that time so that we can still, uh, you know, take our time walking in and we don't have to rush. Um, because you have to remember there is guys slamming bulls in wolf country to high, pre to high pressure country exactly every year. So Scott, how you doing, bud? Uh, Tim Gonzalez, if the wind changes, you got to change elevation to cut the wind, and elk will never second guess his nose. So I, I, I'm telling you guys, if you get on that same elevation, the wind's never going to be a factor. You're still going to check the wind a bunch and make sure. So, uh, Big Skinny, scouting in August, last scout before the hunt. How much time or do we go up high? We haven't seen anything up high yet. So as the season gets closer on my scouting trips like we're heading up uh let's see this weekend i'm flying to oregon for the southern oregon seminar and then next weekend so saturday the 10th we will run up swap the cards out again but as the season gets closer i don't hike around that much in the elk area i want to keep them in their patterns i want to be on opposite high elevations to where i can glass that area this is the time of year starting, uh, in fact, this one on the 10th will be the last time that I actually go into the camera to swap cards. The next time I actually go in there will be opening day of season. And then I'm gonna go right by that camera and I'm gonna pull it. So after that point, that August 10th, so can, you know, let's just say mid-August on, you're gonna do your scouting with your binoculars. You're gonna do your scouting with glass. Now, remember when you're scouting and you're glassing, if you're glassing in the morning, you always want the sun at your back. You don't want to be looking into the sun. You want the sun at your back to be glassing those areas. So, um, but yeah, more, more time on the glass, less time actually hiking around where they live right now. So, but I want it now. I do too. Um, anything you do different in wolf country? Yes, I really tone my calls down. I don't go max volume. In fact, I don't really go with a ton of volume anymore. Um, and I also go with more low audible type sounds, your huffs, your grunts, your raking, that type of stuff. Um, just because I don't want to crack big loud bugles. Because if you really listen to elk, 
in wolf country, they're not coming out into those wide open points and really screaming bugles like they used to. So, uh, Lena, for the first time hunters, what resources would you recommend for tips on how to field dress and pack out? So as far as field dressing, there are a few videos on YouTube that are called gutless. Um, that's, those would be the best resources. Uh, they show you how to break an elk down and quarter it and get it ready for packing without having to gut the elk. Uh, we've done the gutless method for years and it's just, it's a great method and you actually get the elk broken down and ready to pack a lot quicker. As far as loading onto a pack, I have a video on the YouTube channel on how to load a pack. But again, you can, you can just do a search on YouTube, you know, how to load a pack, um, for packing meat or, or something like that. But there's, there's plenty of tutorials and resources out there that you can get to. So, okay. Um, before I get to the questions from Facebook from today, two things that I talked about last week, one was decoy use, and I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Um, so a couple of the ways that I use the decoy, there's two decoys that I really use. One is the butt head from native by Carlton, which if you guys didn't see, they are on sale right now for 50% off. So definitely get over to native by Carlton and pick one of those up. The reason I like that one is because it is on a pole, but it's a three dimensional head. It's a three dimensional face. So I will have that in my hand on the pole and I will twist it to kind of give that head movement. It gives movement and reality into my calling. I'm primarily using that one when I'm back behind as the caller. So the other one that I use quite a bit is the ultimate predator decoy. I really like that one also because it has three uses. One, you can mount it right onto the front of your bow. So if you're solo hunting, it has a slot in the middle that your sight, your stabilizer, and your arrow sticks through. Good concealment. You can actually draw and it covers all that movement. Second way is you can actually take the Velcro and create handles with it. So then you can hold it and you can still turn it a little bit. You can flick that ear to give that movement. Or the third way is you could take that Velcro and you could strap it around a tree and then put that decoy on the tree. Now the things with the decoys is if I'm solo hunting and I'm setting it up, I very rarely set that decoy up in the wide open. I will set it so half of it is kind of behind a bush or this or that. I want it to be partially covered because I want that bull to come in and see enough of the decoy to recognize that it's an elk, but the fact that he has to walk closer to really get the full gist of the picture. Now, second thing that we talked about, and just gonna touch on this briefly because we do have several questions to get to. Um, somebody asked about hunting in grizzly country. The number one advice I can give about hunting in grizzly country is you really need to be on point. You really need, need to be on guard. Um, your senses really need to be tapped in because you most certainly can call in a grizzly while you're calling for elk. The other thing is, is pistol or bear spray. I pack a pistol and sometimes I have packed both in the grizzly country, but I prefer the pistol. Now, the one thing is, is I use the Raptor Bino harness from Black's Creek Guide Gear because it puts that pistol right on my chest, but they also have two straps on the bottom that you could put your bear spray canister. Now, I had a lot of people message me and go, oh, well, I use such and such um, holster and it's on the hip belt of my pack and I, I, I train with that thing for getting it out. Great. Here's a scenario. You shot an elk, the elk's on the ground. You are going to start breaking that elk down. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to take your pack off and set your pack 20, 25 yards away. So when that grizzly comes in, where's your pistol that is on your hip belt? 20, 25 yards away. That's another reason I like the Raptor. So Black's Creek Guide Gear put a lot of thought into this. It's tight on the chest. So you can take your pack off, but that is still sitting there. When you lean over to cut, it doesn't flop out. It stays tight to the chest. But a couple of other things that I really like about it is there's a slot on the left side that I can put my phone 
we all are, well, I'm not gonna say all, but a good majority of us are using our phone with Onyx or Base Map or some other, it's right there. The other thing too is it has the slot for the rangefinder. Again, I got comments from people, oh, I just put a rangefinder belt on, or a rangefinder pouch on the belt of my pack. Great. You're set up on an elk. You're the shooter. You drop your pack where you're shooting, but now all of a sudden you need to slide up 20, 30 yards to get a better shooting angle because of the way the bull's coming in. Where's your rangefinder? Back there with your pack. You also have, you know, a slot. Now, I hunt thicker country, so I don't glass a ton, so I don't keep my binos in that. So now I have that pouch that I can put wind checker, I can put backup calls and put a few snacks in there. So I highly recommend the Raptor guys. Definitely go check it out. Um, yeah, see Mountain Hunter Box. That's what happened to Mark Uptain. So it happens a lot. So, and honestly, with that system on the Raptor, it's very quick to get either out the pistol or the bear spray. Have you called in grizzly country? Yes, I have. And it is unnerving and unsettling. I'm not saying I wouldn't go back because we got into a lot of elk. Um, but if I had my preference to hunt in grizzly country or wolf country, I'm going to hunt in wolf country over grizzly. So, okay. Um, for a pre-rut hunt in early September, what call works best, bugles or cow calls? And actually, you know what? That falls right in line with a question that had over on Facebook. So kind of the same thing, what works best? I don't have an answer because I don't know what works best in every single situation. Each bull is going to be different on what they want to hear, whether they respond to cow calls or whether they respond to bugles. What you need to do is you need to figure that out. So when you're trying to locate, you're sending out cow calls, you're sending out bugles. Sending out cow calls, oop, we got a response. So many people will get that response on cow calls and they immediately switch to bugles. And they're like, God, we only got him a bugle one time. Well, what did, we, what did he respond to? Cow calls. What'd you do after that? Started bugling at him. Why? He answered back to cow calls. Why would you all of a sudden start throwing bugles? Now, you can throw a bugle to see how he's going to respond. You can introduce that bull vocalization to see how he's going to respond. But pay attention to his responses. Okay? Here. If I throw off a cow call and I get a bull that responds, okay, so now I return a bugle. What do you think I'm going to stay with in that situation? He answered excitedly and forcefully to cow calls. But to bugles, he responded timidly. I'm going to stick with cow calls. So to answer that question, what works best? It's going to vary from situation to situation and encounter to encounter. There's not just one set thing that's going to say this is going to work on every single bull. Now, you guys have heard me say that we start out with the breeding sequence. We start out the same way. But based on the interaction and the responses that we're getting from the bulls, we are then going to take multiple different paths depending on the responses and the reactions that we're getting. We let the bulls dictate to us on which direction and avenues we are going to focus more on. So, okay, hopefully that answered that one. Um, when calling for your shooter, have you ever had the shooter cow call to help entice the bull? No, I want my shooter to be quiet because here's what happens in that situation. If my shooter's up front, I'm back behind, I'm calling, and all of a sudden my shooter starts calling, well, now that hang-up spot for that bull is now farther out because remember, he's only going to come up to a point where he thinks he should be able to see that elk that's making the noise. Well, guess what? 
especially if it's a bull and he's cruising looking for cows. Well, dang it, I heard a cow that's 50 yards closer to me than that other one, so I'm going to stand right here and stare for that one. The only time I want my shooter to cow call is when he's cow calling to stop a bull for a shot or stop a cow for a shot. There are things that you can do with a shooter caller to where you guys can call back and forth. But at that point, you are on the same plane. You haven't set up with the shooter out front, caller back behind. You guys are just trying to call back and forth to create some excitement out there. So if we're in the shooter caller scenario with the shooter out front, no, I do not want that shooter making sounds. Do you use more than one call to sound like a group of cows? Diaphragm, read, and squeeze calls. No, you can do it all on a diaphragm. Based on holding your mouth in different positions, you can do different things with your mouth to get different pitches and different tones that will sound like different elk. So, uh, okay, so this one kind of tied into that other one, but what are some of the best strategies for calling early September bulls? Uh, would it be better to look for cows to find the bulls uh, when calling more calling or less calling, which is more efficient? So, all right, so Rick, first off, um, early in the season, I typically focus on dark, damp, cool draws. That's typically where the elk are going to be hanging out because earlier in the season, it's warmer. That's where they're going to be. Now, when calling, more calling, less calling, that really depends on what's happening in the forest. That's really depending on what's going on around me. There's not a set thing that says you have to do 18 cow calls in a 60-second period in order it to be realistic. There, there's nothing like that. It just depends on what's going on around. If the elk around me are really vocal and they're doing a lot, then yeah, I'm gonna do a lot more calling. But if the elk are kind of quiet, I'm gonna have longer pauses in between my calling. So, uh, slightly controversial. I love these. So, uh, but should make for an interesting conversation. Where legal, what are your thoughts on using baits such as apples, alfalfa, grain blocks, etc.? If it's legal in the state, go for it. I mean, any advantage that you can get for finding elk or patterning, patterning elk, I know some states will let you run bait and salt before the season starts, but some of them not as the season's going. So if it's legal, I am all for any form of legal hunting. I am not here to judge. I am not here to criticize or say that's not fair. Or that's not right. If it's legal, do it. I hunt a cow or spike unit, but I love the thought of aggressive elk calling. So my question is, can you aggressively call in cows or spikes uh, this way, or should I keep calling toned down? Great question. If you're focusing on spikes, no, you cannot get aggressive bugling with them. They will get intimidated and you will just push them away. Now, cows early in the season, when bulls are rounding up cows and displaying and doing all that, Yes, you may have a chance early in the season where you're displaying and really being dominant. You're primarily going to be doing this as a blind type calling. There is a chance that you could call in cows. In my experience, I have not really used the aggressive much because my experience, I found that it actually pushes elk away because we can get too aggressive and we can get too unnatural with that. So that's why the breeding sequence or just that cow, three or four mews is what we found works, works best. Uh, what's their routine while rubbing their velvet off? Okay, so here in a couple of weeks, the blood supply to the velvet is gonna shut off. Those are gonna start getting itchy. The testosterone is gonna start rising and they are going to start rubbing the velvet. Really, all they're doing at that point is just rubbing the velvet off and kind of horse playing. They are getting ready to get hard horned so that they can establish their pecking order. They're still hanging out in their summer range at this time. They haven't really started to move down for cows because they don't have that impressive headgear put together yet. So 
what's their normal routine? It's the same thing as their summer routine. Eat, sleep, pack on pounds, pack on calories, get ready for the rut because they're going to lose a ton of weight. So, all right. Uh, to, 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 to. Uh, I scouted preseason in an area in Idaho numerous times only to find out the area was as crowded as the county fair. I think I've hunted there before. Always have many areas to hunt, not just one, a lot like turkey hunting. Absolutely. The more options you have, the better hunt you're going to have. Is chuckling the best way to tell the difference between a person or a bull? Chuckling is the best way, but another way you can also tell is on that bottom end when they finish that oh, at the end. Uh, I mean, bull's lungs and chest cavity is huge, quite a bit bigger than ours. They get depth that we have a really hard time kind of getting. So uh, Benito, joining late, did you talk about hunting midday yet? Yes, I did. And in fact, um, that's kind of the way that I've started going with whatever the topic is. That's the first thing we talk about as soon as we jump in because I had a few some feedback from people that didn't like that they had to wait 20 minutes until I got into the topic that was the title for the evening. So uh, glad we don't have grizz in Arizona until they decide to implant. <laughs> Hunt Montana grizz country annually. I wear an Alaskan chest holder with a 45 auto, no spray. Yeah, and most of the time I just have my, my pistol with me too. Um, but like I said, there have been a couple of times that I've carried both. Um, it's just, it's not that big a deal. It's not that much weight and for my safety, not a bad deal. Uh, agreed. Is chuckling a good way to identify bulls versus other hunter bugles? Hello from Superior, Montana. Jonathan, good evening. Um, starting my scouting now for Arizona late archery bull. Drive unit, put boots on ground, look for sign, uh, proof glassing spots. Don't worry so much about seeing bulls now. Uh, depending on when the late season is, I mean, again, Bulls that you're seeing this time of year and where they're at in a lot of areas, they're not going to be there. Once the rut happens, they may be miles away. Um, and in fact, I, I was I was ecstatic last Saturday when we started in and found those cows because from those cows to where my trail cam is that had different multiple, yeah, had three or four bulls coming in on that um, was about a half a mile apart. That, to me, I was like, oh, plus the sign that we've seen in here, the number of rubs, the number of wallows, I know that those those elk are all going to be right there. So um, I would be more concerned with finding cows right now this time of year and seeing cows because that's another spot that I know early in the season where those bulls are going to go. So. Over the Hill Hunter loved the scree gear, picked up the early season set, going to place a second order. Thanks for the introduction. You are very welcome. And in fact, if you guys, I think today's the last day to get in on that multi-company giveaway, which is a jumping jack trailer, a guided elk hunt, scree gear package, initial ascent pack, a canvas cutter, phone scope. And with any purchase, I think you get 10 additional entries. Um, so I think today is, is the last one. August 7th was the earliest I've seen a bull rubbing off velvet. Always the big bulls lose it first. So yeah, and in fact, I have a bull hanging on the wall over there that I shot in Montana that I shot October 6th, 7th, and he still has dried velvet on his rack. Uh, I was actually focusing on a different bull in the group, had multiple bulls coming or, or going he was coming in with three or four other bulls in single file. As soon as he turned his head and I saw that dried velvet, done. How often do you have an opportunity to put a bull on the ground that still has dried velvet? So, have you tried scouting via Google Earth virtual reality? It's pretty epic if you have to drive a thousand miles to get boot on the ground. Uh, Joseph, I used to scout on Google quite a bit until I found other tools. Uh, and in fact, on the Patreon page, I kind of introduced the patron members to my number one scouting tool. Um, and it's, it's a game changer. I mean, the tools that you have in that are incredible. So if you guys want, want to know more, just go to elkcallingacademy.com. It's $15 a month. 
and it will unlock e-scouting tutorials. You'll see exactly all of the tools through screen sharing that I use. I also go through diaphragm read basics, all of the cow sounds, all of the bull sounds. I talk about the breeding sequence. I even did a mock setup where I was out doing the breeding sequence in the mountains. And based on different responses, I was showing how I adjust. Um, I actually put tags up there saying that bull is probably gonna come either on this path or this path. So really, really broke it down. Uh, and also with that, um, every two weeks we have a private Q&A that is only for Patreon members. Uh, in fact, some, a lot of people are chiming in saying it's worth every penny. Uh, gear giveaways. In fact, I just gave away a $650 Blacks Creek Guide Gear Pack two weeks ago to one of the members. So, um, but yes, I have used Google Earth in the past. I just think there are tools out there that are much better that you can learn so much more. And in fact, I've gone back into areas uh, with my number one tool, I've gone back into areas that I hunted for years and years and years and actually found pieces and pockets and hidden spots that I never even knew were there. So, uh, Joshua, do you have a video that goes more into the breeding sequence? Yes, I do. It's, it's at that elkcallingacademy.com. So, um, Colorado has late summer archery hunts. What is the best calling to do? Um, you know, late summer, man, they really haven't started gathering up yet. I'm going to focus on those cow sounds, maybe some, some lost calf, distressed calf. you know, play on those maternal instincts of the cows. So, uh, Nicholas, can I go scouting with you? <laughs> so, um, I agree. Find the cows first. Bulls will find you. Absolutely. Brad Lowry worth every penny. Do it. Do it. I love you guys. I'm a member definitely worth every penny. So thanks. We'll get on it. I'm sure it will be money well spent. Uh, was talking via virtual reality though. <sighs> no, the virtual reality portion of Google Earth, um, I haven't really played with it a ton. Um, maybe I need to do that. Maybe I need to go play with it some more. So, hey, Patreon members, there might be coming a, uh, another video there. I'll go play with it more. And uh, Joseph, I'll kind of give you some feedback on, on what I think. So. Uh, just received six new natives in the mail today. Thanks for the insight on call selection. Brad, you are very welcome. So, all right, guys, we have about eight minutes until the countdown starts. So last round for questions. Um, okay, events coming up this Friday, August 2nd. I will be in uh, at, at Southern Oregon Archery uh, doing a seminar at 630. Uh, should, probably going to go for a couple of hours. Um, and then Friday, August 9th, I will be at Archery Central here in the Boise area. So that is the one and only local seminar I'm doing this year. Uh, definitely, we have oh giveaways from Bendable Products, Native by Carlton, Elk Calling Academy swag. Um, I think also in Southern Oregon, we have some giveaways from Ready Nutrients. Um, definitely, definitely some good giveaways. So, all right, guys, last round for questions, get last bit of questions in. Let me make sure that we have covered everything. Okay. I think we actually hit everything that were submitted from today. Okay, that seems like everything that we have. So um, also to um, Bri Bri had a question about different burns. Okay, what's what's the question about uh, about burns? Um, thank you for all the great info. Lena, you're welcome. Thanks for tuning in tonight. So 
Uh, some of you guys that are getting some of these Native by Carlton reads in, just a couple of quick things to cover. So if you get the ECA read, the thing you need to remember with the ECA read is it's more air driven than it is tongue driven. You can put too much tongue pressure in it. So if all you're getting is kind of that high squeak, you have too much tongue pressure, back it off. Uh, Brian, I posted it in Instagram. When did you post it? Because I'm not seeing anything on. Let me refresh real quick and see if there's one that came in late. Bingo. Okay. Uh, burns. Would you go rather hunt a 2017 burn at 6,000 feet in elevation or a 2012 burn at seven to 9,000 elevation during peak rut, peak rut with a rifle? Um, so there's, there's, there's kind of a couple of factors that, that kind of play into that. You know, how hot was the fire? How bad did it devastate the landscape? Um, is it, you know, barren like the surface of the moon? Um, kind of that kind of stuff. Is it, you know, did feed come back? So, um, I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're rifle hunting, uh, 6,000, seven to nine the the year really doesn't matter about the burn 2017 2012 and also the elevation doesn't matter too because i've hunted elk at, at you know within those elevation ranges um if you have the ability to kind of get in there and see what kind of tracks or what kind of sign are rolling through those that might really determine and if they're close enough depending on how long your hunt is you might spend part of your time at one and part you know at another um, but burns definitely are good areas to hunt um, yeah I would just kind of do some scouting and that's that's where that summertime scouting and glassing to see what's moving through those areas because um, rifle hunt and it is during the peak rut time so yeah, I would say kind of divide your time in between those. And you might also work the fringes, you know, the timber on the edge of those. Uh, elk love that timber that's on the edge of the fire. So I know, um, you know, with a rifle, nice thing is, is um, you can reach out a little bit farther than what you can with a bow. Um, and, and don't, you know, even though you're rifle hunting, don't. Don't be scared to take calls. Don't be scared to bugle, um, you know, especially in those, because if you have elk that's in that heavy timber, that thick, that dark timber that's on the edge of those burns, you could most certainly get out there and you could broadcast a bugle and get a response and have that bull step out to try to see the bull that's making the bugle up where you were. And that could de most definitely generate a shot for you. So. All right, hunting Colorado archery this year, looking hard at mesas and areas above private hay pasture ground. This works well in Montana, guessing it would be the same. Yes, um, you know, and a lot of times you can find really good travel corridors that those elk are taking from their bedding area down through the timber and out into uh, those private alfalfa, alf alfalfa areas. Uh, and hunting, hunting those travel corridors can be really, really effective. The tricky thing that I found on those sometimes is because elk are always moving with the wind in their nose, typically those travel corridors are elevated a little bit from that hay field, that alfalfa field. And so if you get too close, your thermals are really going to be kind of blowing down and it's going to affect which direction they go. Sometimes you might be better off getting even higher on elevation because with the higher elevation, you can actually hear a little better. And then basically, you know, you can you can go, OK, they're hitting this corridor. They're going to be heading up to this spot. And then you move and kind of position yourself to kind of cut them off. You're off to the side and you may have to basically be um, heading up a separate, complete different drainage to catch them in an area, you know, where you get that opportunity to be on the same level and thermals are, are accurate. And it. it or the thermals are correct so that you can work that bull. And it may be 
that maybe you just need to sit from a distance and listen, you know, the first morning or something. Okay, they're coming out, they're heading up this way. Now we kind of know where they're going. And then that evening when they head back, now you have that information and you can stage yourself to control your thermals, but still have the ability to get ahead of them and engage with them. Have you ever hunted Unit 16 in Wyoming? If so, any information? Troy, I have not. So I have not hunted uh, Wyoming yet. So, all right, guys, countdown is on. We have a minute and a half left. So we are going to call it for tonight. I appreciate each and every one of you for tuning in. Thank you for the interaction and questions. This just gets funner and funner each week as more people tune in and interact. So hopefully you got your question answered tonight. If you guys want to dive deeper into this, I, you know, definitely go to elkcallingacademy.com. Um, check it out. There are, you know, a lot of tutorials and instructions there. As always, guys, keep calling, keep practicing. Most importantly, though, have fun while doing it. And we're going to see you guys next week on the next episode of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A brought to you by Elk Calling Academy. Hope you all have a great week.